Dramatic rises from poverty to prosperity, whether among nations or among various immigrant groups in countries around the world, undermine the notion of haves and have-nots as enduring categories of people frozen into their respective positions by social and economic forces. Indeed, the histories reviewed in the preceding chapters suggest that a more fruitful dichotomy might be between the doers and the do-nots. Since many peoples and nations have played both roles at different times in their histories, questions arise as to how and why wealth is created abundantly under some conditions and not under others. But to put that question on the agenda would be to abandon much of the intellectual and political agenda of those who focus on the distribution of wealth, as if its creation could be taken for granted, as something that happens somehow, and as if its uneven distribution, either within a given country or between nations, could only be explained by malign forces or sinister machinations. Moreover, once inherent prerequisites for producing wealth are recognized, such unevenness is neither surprising nor inherently suspect, since there is no a priori reason to expect these prerequisites to be evenly distributed. Therefore, academic standards, employment standards, and other criteria can no longer be dismissed as arbitrary impositions of barriers with disparate impact by race, class, gender, or other social groupings. While cultures compete, and while this competition results in winners and losers among the products of different cultures, this does not mean that the flesh-and-blood human beings whose cultural artifacts no longer remain functional are necessarily losers in the process. On the contrary, in many cases they gain a higher standard of living and a wider cultural exposure which they themselves come to value and embrace. Again, this represents not simply the values of an observer, but the preferences revealed by the behavior of the people concerned, as they abandon their own traditional ways of doing particular things in favor of ways they have discovered in the cultures of others. Nor is this a particularly modern development. The earliest known civilizations borrowed extensively from one another. Thousands of years before Christ, metallurgical techniques from the Middle East diffused into the steppes of Central Asia. Horseback riding techniques and musical instruments developed in Central Asia spread to China, and a great variety of products and processes flowed from China to the West over the centuries. Gunpowder, paper, printing, porcelain, silk, canal locks, wheelbarrows, rudders for boats and ships, and playing cards, for example. In the other direction, art styles from ancient Greece and Rome made their way along the Silk Road to China. The culture of ancient Korea was almost all of Chinese origin. Happy endings are of course not guaranteed in all cultural encounters. Some groups have been oppressed in many ways for many generations, or even centuries, because they would not give up their cultures. This was the fate of the Jews in Europe and Central Asians under both the Tsars and the Communists. The point here is not to assess whether most cultural competition ends happily or unhappily, but rather to indicate that the competition of cultures takes place both within societies and between societies. Cultures compete at many levels. They compete most obviously in warfare, for the outcomes of wars of conquest can determine what language the descendants of the combatants will speak for centuries to come, what concepts will organize their thoughts, and what values will shape their moral universe. The Western Hemisphere is an outpost of European civilization because Europeans won the wars of conquest in this part of the world. Today, even those in the Western Hemisphere who hate European civilization express that hatred in a European language and denounce it as immoral by European standards of morality. The alternatives they propose likewise tend to follow European concepts. Pan-Africanism, for example, is not an African concept, but a European concept applied to Africa, paralleling such notions as Pan-Slavism and Pan-Germanism, but having little in common with the strong local and tribal loyalties of Africa. A whole generation of post-independence African leaders, educated in Europe and the United States, has proclaimed the ideology of Pan-Africanism while having their hands full trying to hold together countries torn apart by internal tribal rivalries. Wars are only one of the ways in which cultures compete. More continuously and more pervasively, they compete in the many practical ways that cultures serve human purposes. 
from the growing of food to trying to understand the motions of the stars. Agricultural methods and astronomy are just two of many features taken over by one culture from another and spread around the world. Yet, even when one culture supersedes another, seldom is it more satisfactory in every way, so that laments for the lost virtues of abandoned cultures have been both common and understandable. But there is no need for nostalgia to corrupt history or for rejected cultural artifacts to be resurrected at public expense, much less imposed on others for obligatory admiration. Above all, there is no need to encourage those who have progressed by cultural borrowings to retrogress by painting themselves into their own cultural corner and taking upon themselves the arduous burden of advancing solely by what their own subgroup can accomplish in isolation from the wider world, which has long been the cultural resource of peoples, nations, and whole civilizations.